I think it goes without saying that movies can be pretty expensive, especially considering that on occasion studios will invest the equivalent of a small country's GDP into these things. And with that comes the desire to ensure that what they've put so much money into is actually going to be a success. And so many studios have overstepped their creative boundaries when it comes to dictating what goes into the final product. I can't imagine how frustrating it must be to want to bring your own vision of something to life, only to have a bunch of crusty old people standing in the corner and yelling at you about what you can and can't do. This is the whole reason that directors cut exist in the first place, because they actually have to advertise a version of the film that hasn't been tainted by out-of-touch studio executives telling other people how to do their job. Like, shouldn't the movie be the director's cut? And in light of recent news, I thought it might be fun to have a look at all of the other times that studios have forced their way into screwing up all kinds of films, both ones that ended up as successes anyway, and ones where their interference proved to be fatal. Studio meddling has resulted in some of the most despised films across the years, so much so that there's just too many to choose from. But I think it'd be fun if we started with... Many movies have been significantly changed for the worse because studios think that audiences are complete idiots. And yeah, they may have a point, but come on. Blade Runner, for example, had a hell of a time when it came to studio interference, mainly because of the constant disagreements between Ridley Scott and the studio. Believing the film to just be too confusing for anyone below the age of five, Warner Bros. insisted that narration be added by Harrison Ford to basically explain the entire plot of the movie, which in theory was supposed to make it less confusing to viewers, but only served to over-explain the whole thing. Harrison Ford Ford, as you can imagine, was not too keen on this idea, and so decided that he was going to do it with the same level of enthusiasm that I did my school assignments. They don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. Ex-cop. Ex-blade <laughs> And then they used it anyway. <laughs> The original ending was also changed because of its ambiguity, actually making for a thought-provoking conclusion that doesn't answer all of the questions it raises. So instead, an incredibly out-of-place scene was added where they just drive off into the sunset, which makes absolutely no sense in the wider context of the movie. As you can imagine, upon its initial release, Blade Runner wasn't too popular with critics at the time due to the inconsistent tone. And man, I wonder who was at fault for that. Ever since, there's been like a million different versions of the movie released trying to rectify the mistakes of the theatrical cut, which definitely makes it fun when trying to decide what version you're supposed to watch, Jesus Christ. The important ones though are the director's cut from 1992 and the final cut from 2007. In spite of its name though, the director's cut truthfully didn't have a lot of involvement from Ridley Scott, aside from him just kind of approving it. This version removed the awful studio mandated happy ending, instead just cutting to credits immediately after turning the entire movie on its head, with the hilarious voiceover narration now sadly not included. But that sadly meant that we missed out on more of this. Replicants weren't supposed to Replicants have Replicants weren't supposed to have feelings. God, I hate my Lie. It wasn't until 15 years later that the final cut was released, where Ridley Scott was finally given creative control over it, and so it added back in all of the removed scenes while keeping the ending from the director's cut intact, all to become what people now consider the definitive version of Blade Runner. The exact same thing happened to the film Dark City a decade later, where opening narration was added in post to the theatrical version that literally spoils the entire plot of the movie in the opening, all because the studio felt it would be too confusing for audiences to have to actually watch the movie. Dark City is a movie about a dying race called the strangers who come to Earth to learn about humanity in order to save themselves. All of which is information you aren't supposed to find out until near the end of the movie. But the studio decided that it would be far better for you to know all of this within the first 10 seconds. They were a race as old as time itself. They had mastered the ultimate technology, the ability to alter physical reality. I will alone. Dude, come on! So instead of getting to be dropped into this mysterious and nonsensical world and gradually receiving clues along with the protagonist to find out what's really going on, you instead are just made aware right from the get-go and then have to watch as the main character catches up to what you already know. Wow, that's so much more fun. Thanks, guys. And once again, an extended director's cut was later released that removes this awful studio edition, which is again considered to be the much better version of the movie, leaving the intro instead entirely silent, as it fucking should be. Can you guys just leave, like, something to the imagination, please? John Carpenter's the thing almost suffered the same fate with its incredible ambiguous ending, whereby an alternate version saw McCready being rescued at the film's climax with a blood test later revealing that he wasn't infected, which is incredibly boring, and yet another where Childs was removed from the climax entirely, leaving only McCready by his lonesome before the credits rolled, which was the ending they nearly went with at the studio's request until they eventually decided at the last minute that the original conclusion was in fact the best one, since it kept the audience guessing right until the very end, much to the distaste of studio executives who like having everything answered for them. Why don't we just wait here for a little while? Okay. And while we're on the topic of The Thing, let's talk about The Thing. The 2011 one. Here's The Thing. 
Originally, this prequel, disguised as a sequel that wasn't a reboot, relied entirely on practical effects for its creature, just like in the original film, and was pretty much fully completed with these effects intact. But then someone up at Universal was just too afraid that a modern big budget movie that didn't have PS1 looking CGI would make it stand out too much. So the entire movie was redone with this fucking awful looking CGI, which just... How anyone thought this looked better than this is just... I don't... Curse you, Universal! Allegedly, they were worried that going practical would make it look too much like an 80s movie. Which is the dumbest excuse I have ever heard, considering the effects from the 1980 version are leagues above this shit. I can't imagine putting in all this work to make the effects look this fantastic, only to then have it never see the light of day and be completely covered up by something infinitely worse that is the sole reason most people hate the movie now. I know for a fact that the original horrible Sonic design was a studio decision, who apparently knew it would be controversial, to put it very lightly, but felt it would be eventually accepted. So how'd that one turn out for you guys? Superhero films get it especially rough nowadays when it comes to studio stepping in. 2015's Fantastic Four is now infamous for being one of the most disastrous movies to come out in recent times, both before and after its production, the result of constant arguing from the director, Josh Trank, and 20th Century Fox. Originally, Trank intended for the film to lean more into a body horror angle, something that quite obviously would have posed quite a risk for a well-known superhero brand. Some of this can be seen left intact in the final film, most notably the scenes of them first discovering their powers. Allegedly, right from the beginning, Trank didn't have a a great deal of creative freedom, with Fox demanding high-profile actors being selected for the roles. And then even after the movie was finished, they were so dissatisfied that they stepped in themselves to heavily alter the movie. In this case though, it may not have been entirely Fox's fault, as the details of what actually happened with this film are pretty sketchy and unclear. But it was said that Trank himself wasn't exactly on his best behaviour while making it. Whoopsie. And yet, despite all of that, I actually kind of like this movie. But don't worry, I'd never admit that publicly. Spider-Man 3 was famously interfered with by one of its producers, insisting that Venom be the focal point point of the movie, despite the original concept for the film already having Sandman and Green Goblin as the main antagonist. Sam Raimi reportedly wasn't a big fan of Venom, but in the end was pressed to include him. And we all know how that turned out. <laughs> Amazingly. And they clearly didn't learn their lesson because they did the exact same thing with The Amazing Spider-Man 2 a few years later. This rebooted series was originally planned as a trilogy, but upon seeing the enormous success of the MCU, Sony became greedy and decided they wanted to set up their own Spider-Man universe. Which they're actually still trying to do for some reason. So they insisted that the film feature a variety of different Spider-Man villains in order to set up future movies. Once again, totally overstuffing the film and taking attention away from the more integral elements like character development, and a coherent narrative. And all of this resulted in them not only fucking up the final movie, but then also cancelling all of those planned spin-offs anyway. So, real nice going there, guys. Alien 3 is another infamous case of having a hellish development cycle, with its original director being kicked off early into the project after the studio was unhappy with his idea for the movie, and instead brought on then-rookie director David Fincher. Due to his fairly unknown status at the time, Fincher was barely allowed any creative freedom from the studio whatsoever, which was the first of many bad decisions. They started shooting before the script was even finished, which is never a good idea. And then to pile on even more work, Fox constantly insisted on adding reshoots that continually changed the direction of the movie. Fincher ended up leaving by the time they reached the editing process, as I think any rational person would by that point. And it wasn't until many years later that an assembly cut was released that was more in line with what Fincher was setting out to do. Which basically anyone you ask will say is the better version of the film. So maybe just like, let the director do his job, guys. The now acclaimed crime movie Once Upon a Time in America was a 10 year long project for its director, with the finished version eventually clocking in at a whopping 229 minutes long, which the studio took one look at and went, nope. Turning a nearly four hour film into 139 minutes quite obviously left out just a few important details, and as such it was absolutely reviled by critics, and to add even more insult to injury, only made back 5 million against its budget of 30 million dollars. It wasn't until after the director's death that the full original version was released and is now hailed as one of the greatest crime movies of all time. Good going everyone, you nailed it. I must admit, I haven't actually seen this one though, because I mean, come on. A lot of the films that I've covered so far seem to be ones that were either really divisive or hated when they came out. I wonder why that might be. Sometimes all a studio has to do is change the ending to completely ruin a movie. Take my favourite example, the 2007 film I Am Legend. A movie about Will Smith being the lone survivor of an apocalypse caused by an airborne virus that's wiped out most of mankind and turned those who remain into horribly aged CGI. One that I think is honestly really fantastic right up until the very end, which after researching what happened behind the scenes, I can finally understand why. Spoiler alert for a 14 year old movie by the way. Just. 
just in case. So the film ends when Will Smith and two other survivors he found are surrounded in his lab by the creatures. And after managing to manufacture a new cure in like five seconds, he sends the two away to safety before sacrificing his life to blow them all up for seemingly no apparent reason because he could have just as easily gone with them, but sure. Now this isn't an awful ending on its own. It's worst crime as just being a pretty generic climax for a zombie movie, which would be fine if I Am Legend was a zombie movie. See, originally the movie was supposed to end with the creatures simply wanting to have one of their own back after Will Smith kidnap them to do experiments on, and upon returning her, learns they're actually intelligent beings who he's been terrorizing this entire time, with them having avoided him until he took one of their own as a hostage. And the name of the movie is supposed to reflect Will Smith's status among the creatures as a boogeyman who hunts them in their sleep, caused by his gradual decline in sanity as seen throughout the movie. I like Shrek. Which the studio decided was all just far too complicated for audiences to not have the scary naked CGI monsters be the bad guys, and so instead replaced it with the equally thought-provoking ending of him just exploding. This tacked on finale entirely disregards all of the previous clues set up throughout the movie that these things are more than they seem. And so a lot of their strange behavior throughout the movie just goes totally unexplained without this added context. But to be fair, it's not like this was solely the filmmaker's fault. The original ending was shown twice to test audiences and both times it was rejected, which resulted in them eventually just changing it. And that's a whole other problem for us to talk about. Test audiences. Probably the single worst influence on a studio that you can possibly have. For those who don't know, occasionally studios will offer free screenings to literally random people off the street of their upcoming movies in order to gauge their reactions and ask for feedback about what they did and didn't like, all to take into account whether they're about to lose millions of dollars. Which does mean that these people can completely ruin a movie for everyone else just by having a shit opinion. But like you could argue that test audiences really aren't a good way of predetermining the success of a movie considering you're relying on a really small sample of people versus the entire rest of the planet. Arguably the most ridiculous instance of this was the original ending of Little Shop of Horrors, which saw the protagonist Seymour getting bored by a plant, who would then proceed to take over the entire world in an incredibly impressive display of special effects. All of which went to complete waste because it was then replaced with a much lazier happy ending when test audiences decided they didn't like it. I didn't even like this movie and this still pisses me off. I don't know who you test audiences are, but you're all monsters. But hey, maybe I'm not being fair enough. There have to have been some times where studio interference has benefited the movie. I mean, they have to have gotten it right sometimes, right? <laughs> I think the greatest case for studios being in the right is without a doubt the original idea for Toy Story. See, the problem was that initially Woody was going to be a complete fucking asshole. Even more so than he was in the final movie. A version of the film was shown to Disney executives who were appalled by it, and to be honest, I kind of see where they were coming from here. Just use you... this vast reserve of brain power to consider this for a moment. If it wasn't for me, Andy wouldn't pay any attention no, to you at all. Fact, you would have been thrown away to Google a long time ago, so shut your mouth. <laughs> the project was almost immediately cancelled until the team requested two more weeks to refine the film into one that was instead about a group of toys traumatizing a disturbed child, which was apparently totally fine. So yeah, good call on that one, guys. Event Horizon didn't get a lot of love when it came out, but has since gained a cult following of people who really love it, myself included. After seeing a near-complete version of the film, execs were reportedly horrified by the amount of gore in it. <laughs> Pussies. And so had the film trimmed down and oversaw the removal of several important scenes. Did, did you guys forget to read the script? But for once, I honestly think using the gore sparingly benefits the movie more than it hurts it, since I found it much scarier only getting to see brief glimpses into the hell the movie alludes to. And while I admit I'm too curious, curious to not want to see the original version. I love Event Horizon as it is. DreamWorks' How to Train Your Dragon movie was initially supposed to follow the books a lot more closely, but it was in fact the studio that encouraged them to stray away from the source material and take more creative risks. Now, I'm not sure if anyone aside from me has actually read the books, but in them, Toothless is a lot smaller, can communicate with Hiccup through a language called Dragonese, and is just generally kind of an asshole. And considering how iconic the scenes of Toothless and Hiccup soaring across the ocean now are, I think for once it was actually a good call to not stick too closely to the source material. And on that note, I think that's about all I wanted to cover when it came to movies that have been meddled with. But I do have some time for some fan mail. Do you remember in the last fan mail how I said I was really excited to get one package? Well now look, I think eventually I'm going to have to realize I just have too much mail. I want to start with this one that one of my friends got me. Fortnite Sex Gamer 69. <laughs> oh my god, that's brilliant. Hold on. <laughs> 
<laughs> How does that look? I never thought I'd have my face on a t-shirt, but there we go. That is fucking brilliant. Thank you, Liam. Dear Diamond Bolt slash Adam slash the ultimate Marie Simp. This was sent in December 2020. Oh my God. My name is Lee and I'm 13 years old and I live in the UK. Probably 14 now. Even though I discovered your channel this year, I'm kind of a huge fan of yours. I remember the first video I watched was your Clutch Powers video. Sorry if I don't have any fan art, but I do have some movies and TV shows you can use for future videos. Anyway, I hope you get around 10 million subscribers, upload more on next year and become a big meme from Lee. Well, one of those things happened. <laughs> and don't ever apologize for not having fan art. I love these letters just as much. Thank you very much, Lee. And sorry it took me so long. Every time I look at these letters, I hate my own handwriting even more. Dear Diamond Bolt, for confidential reasons, I will go by accidental genius. First off, I just want to say that I'm a big fan. Your videos have made me laugh when I felt sad and just all around put me in a better mood. My brother was the one to get me started on your videos and it would make him very happy if you gave him a shout out, Little Bear. Shout out to my boy, Little Bear. I live in the US. I don't know much about Australia. Is Vegemite as gross as people have said? No, that is slander. I also have a few questions. Have you watched Voltron Legendary Defender? I watched about four seasons of it and then I just kind of fell out of it, to be honest. Favorite Christmas movie? Mine's Home Alone, except the third one. It can burn in hell. There's a third one? Most embarrassing meet up with a fan. Every encounter I've had in person with people who know me from my videos has been absolutely delightful. I think I'm the one that's being embarrassing, not them. Do you ever wonder where you'd be if you didn't start a YouTube channel? Probably with a lot of student loan debt. A comment for your haters. No, honestly, I agree with them. No more questions, you're welcome. There is a separate sheet of paper with graffiti I did for you from Accidental Genius. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Thank you very much, man. Hi, Diamond Bolt. I love your videos and I just want to say that you inspire me. I also have a few questions. Will you ever visit the Netherlands? Once I'm allowed to go outside, yes. If Big Chungus and live action Cat in the Hat got into a fight, who would win? Well, considering the Cat in the Hat is involved, it wouldn't be a fight, it would be a slaughter. Have a nice day from Vince. Well, that was short and sweet. <laughs> G'day, Diamond Bolt. My name is Ben and I would like to thank you for all the laughs you have given and the lessons you have taught. Uh, anything that I have taught you to do is probably not a good thing. Like how a villain should be. This is really important to me because I want to become an author. Oh, I would also like to thank you for showing me the wonders of anime since I've been watching Dora Quest on Amazon Prime. How old are you? Oh, I feel like I'm 48 at this point. Do you have a job? This is my job. Thank you for the jokes and please keep making videos. P.S. I think I'm turning weeb. What should I do? It's too late. I'm sorry. No one can save me now. Dear Diamond Bolt. Hi, my name is Sam. I watched your Rick and Morty Ruined Forever video in 2020. I personally thought it was very educational with some good life lessons. Did it? I didn't even remember. <laughs> I strongly agree that people should be more respectful and understanding about people's hobbies, even if it sees them as weird or creepy. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Have you watched the anime Attack on Titan and are you a fan? I've seen the first two seasons and I like season two a lot more. I will watch the rest eventually. What's your favorite romance anime scene? Mine is A Silent Voice. The ending of your lie in April? That shit broke me. I really like your personality, so please continue to be yourself and don't let others get you down. Kind regards, Sam. They've written on the back a bunch of their favorite anime, which is really cute. I've seen that one, that one, that one, and that one. Ah, oh, I see I'm in the presence of someone with excellent taste. Ah, oh, Code Geass. Oh, fuck yeah, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, I've seen the first season and I, I've been putting off finishing the rest of it. So now I guess I, I have to. Ah, <laughs> oh, dude, thank you so much. Okay, last one for today. This one is really heavy, so I'm really worried about what's in it. Ah, <laughs> oh, God damn it. What the fuck am I supposed to do with these? <laughs> oh my God. Dude, they got me the ultimate guide to Minecraft and the advanced strategy guide to Minecraft. Whoa, okay, that one's actually... Oh my god, I love that issue. That is fucking awesome. I'm sorry, I am taking that out because I want to read it. <laughs> issue 77 as well. And a letter, there we go. I was getting worried there wasn't going to be a letter because I really want to know who to thank. I've been meaning to write a fan letter for a while now, but held off so long because of anxiety. Anyways, I discovered your channel through 15 scariest things in Transformers. <sighs> which both traumatized me and got me into your channel. Probably traumatized you because of the mic quality. To celebrate everyone's favorite spooky month, I thought we should take a look at the scary stuff. Since then, watching your stuff has been one of the biggest sources of entertainment and comfort. The things you talk about always seem interesting and your humor is top notch. Thanks to you, two of my friends and I have started a horror movie cult and we've watched quite a few movies now, including Slender Man and Darknet. Dude, this, this is, is Darknet. Darknet. The other contents of this box should be two Minecraft books. I didn't know what to do with them. Some old Transformers comics from my local comic shop, very dear to me, but I wanted to give some to you anyway. Aw, dude, thank you. Thanks for so many good times, laughs, and memories, and I'm sorry for the long letter. Yours truly, much love from Canada, producer of maple syrup, and a lot more cartoons than I thought, Jasper. Oh man, that really warmed my heart. Oh, getting to own, like, actual issues of the comic is so cool. I'm lying, the real reason I'm excited is because of the advanced strategy of Minecraft. You don't understand, I'm about to, I'm about to wreck so many noobs, and these, I don't know what to do with, because I don't have any jars around. Big thank you to everyone's mail today. Thank you all so very much, I really appreciate 
appreciate it as always. If you want to send me something for me to open, please send it to this address right here. And if you'll excuse me, I have some Minecraft and anime to attend to.